um, get started uh, just about now. We're so delighted uh, to welcome Professor Chloe Aman to our colloquium today. Chloe is an assistant professor of anthropology at Cornell, and her research explores what urban and environmental futures look like in and after the toxic sedimentations of industrialization and modernity in American cities. Uh, Chloe answers this question by dwelling in the polluted wastescapes of Baltimore, where racialized populations are exposed to premature death in the form of produced toxins that permeate the air, the water, and earth. In what is a dense field of environmental and racial justice emerging both in geography and in anthropology, uh, Chloe's recent articles in American Ethnologist and also in Cultural Anthropology focus on the ways in which the possibilities of both technocratic projects to deal with waste, um, but also um, community opposition to them, for example, uh, opposition to waste to energy plants in Baltimore, both kinds of projects and, and activisms are made by wielding time, uh, temporality, and futures. Um, Chloe is the author of a much anticipated book, Futures After Progress, Hope and Doubt in Late Industrial Baltimore, which will be out very shortly, uh, I think in May, uh, May of this year, um, and it's published by University of Chicago Press. Um, so he's currently conducting new research on the disturbing emergencies of eco-fascism in the United States. And I want to lastly mention that Chloe is also part of an emergent gathering, the No Panels Just Vibes Collective, mm -hmm. focusing on the importance of rest, support, and rec recuperation in academic life. Um, today we will follow what is an experimental colloquium format we began last week. Um, so where Chloe will talk for 45 minutes, uh, followed by a Q&A session here. At around 1.10, 1.15, um, all of us will retreat to the, um, to the lounge where there will be coffee and cookie and cookies and Chloe will be, will be there as well. And so please join me in, in coming to the lounge and having a more informal conversation between 1.15 and whenever, 1.30 or 2 o'clock, wherever you have to um, go to do the next thing you have to do, yeah? So, so yes, new format, um, and for now, uh, please join me in welcoming to your mind. Thank you for the warm welcome and for inviting me to come and speak a bit about my work. Um, I'll start with a few orienting words about my research in general, and then I want to briefly call in the immediate political context, moving me to share this work, which diverges from my usual book talk. All right, so I, uh, I'm a historical and environmental anthropologist, and I have been working on the heavily industrialized South Baltimore Peninsula for the past 12 to 14 years, depending where you mark the real beginning. And the timeline is fuzzy because before I was a researcher, I was an elementary school teacher uh, in, in this area. And before that, I was raised in Maryland, which just means that I exist in a relationship of long-term material intimacy with South Baltimore. That intimacy takes many forms as this place receives trash and processes wastewater for thousands. It's very likely that my family used a fertilizer produced in this community to green our lawn. It's also very likely that the hospital waste from my birth and my sisters and my daughters traveled to this area for burning, and maybe yours too. Hospitals from as far away as Canada truck their refuse to South Baltimore. Um, I was mentioning this a little bit earlier, but Baltimore and Philly go way back, having traded in industrial wares and industrial waste, but also in contagious bodies, which they sent to one another in the 19th century to trigger quarantine measures that would mess with trade at a really formative moment in the making of the place where my work is based. Um, it is one of the weirder urban rivalries in the mid-Atlantic, uh, but I, I, I won't get too much into quarantine today. I just mentioned this to give you uh, a sense of how many people are structurally implicated in the story that I'm gonna share with you today. So there's not really an outside from which to ponder this peninsula, just various uh, vectors of relation and complicity marked by um, degrees of disregard. So belatedly, yeah, here is the South Baltimore Peninsula, and you can glimpse its industrial texture in this watercolor map, which is by a local artist named Taylor Smith-Hams. 
and its relationship with the rest of the city becomes clear in the top right corner, where you can see why some call this the snaggle tooth of Baltimore. My work tells a story from this place, but not only about it. It is about the absolutely integral role this site has played in the governance of future danger for the past 200 years, from again its early life as a quarantine zone under precautionary public health regimes, through years provisioning the US military for both real and speculative warfare, and manifest in recent plans to build the nation's largest trash incinerator there, build as a climate solution, and euphemistically called the Fairfield Renewable Energy Project. So broadly, I consider how efforts by city, state, nation, and corporation to master the future have produced an ambiguously toxic atmosphere that has shaped years off local lives. And I explore how people living here, amid the haze kicked up by an aging industrial order, relate to the future after long-held expectations fall apart. A lot of my work dwells within this aftermath, considering the modes of speculative imagination taking hold on this peninsula, some of which are honestly quite hopeful. As I propose in my forthcoming book, yes, out in May, um, South Baltimore is a place where people are reckoning with the end of the life world, and so it has a lot to teach about the paths we might yet take in the face of ecological apocalypse. But today I don't want to speak allegorically about what we might learn from this peninsula. I want to speak in very concrete terms about what this relentless pull to, toward the future has meant for people living in South Baltimore. I want to do it now, in the wake of a major local accident, a devastating blast at this coal terminal, which you can see in the backdrop, a stone's throw from schools, parks, businesses, and homes, which broke windows and sent a thick layer of carcinogenic coal dust into the air, which coated every surface in a 12-block radius. Deliberations at the city, state, and corporate level, which are unfolding as we speak, concern what steps should be taken to prevent the next disaster. And this matters, of course, but it also risks repeating a containment of danger to the future that has long structured violence in this part of Baltimore. So the talk I'll share takes us to a moment in the late Cold War that's been feeling awfully familiar to me lately. It was a moment when industrial accidents were on the rise, the state was fixated on apocalyptic threats, and residents of two local neighborhoods on this peninsula, Fairfield and Wagner's Point, fought for a buyout of their homes through recourse to the threat of next disaster. A quick word on the title, Time Bomb. I borrow this phrase from a former resident, and you'll see it's an incredibly perceptive term for parsing complex temporalities of injury, but it's also a useful term politically, as it invites a real sustained analysis of cause. A time bomb is something with explosive potential that starts ticking well before the boom. It names a problem that grows explosive over time. So the argument behind the argument that I'll share with you today is that the recent coal blast started at least 200 years ago, and that understanding this is indispensable to any intervention, lest we repeat the tragedy that follows. You can't see toxics, but you can be very agitated about blowing up. Rena told me in April 2016. Rena was an older white woman who provided legal support for residents in South Baltimore who sought to leave their homes in the 1990s, and we were sitting in her living room discussing what she remembered of the buyout. I'd asked her to describe the place to me. Rena worked with residents of Fairfield and Wagner's Point, collectively the point, both on the South Baltimore Peninsula, located roughly here and here. For more than a century before their homes were purchased and demolished, the segregated towns had housed two tight-knit groups of people. The all-black Fairfield homes were once the Cadillac of projects, as a former resident put it. Polish families in Wagner's Point lived in the same red houses for 100 years. Today, the only remnant of their presence is a mid-century brick building first constructed as a school, and since converted into a warehouse for containers that hold hazardous materials. Before I spoke with Rena, I'd driven through the place plenty of times, been hit by its sharp smell, and grown accustomed to the heavy airborne matter that clings to nearly everything. But my first visit happened eight years after residents left their homes. What did it look like, I asked, when people actually lived here? Look, said Rena, setting down her mug to pantomime. It looked as though an angry god had taken some monopoly pieces, the houses, and thrown them in the middle of this big industrial ring. 
For all the subtle signs of trouble in the air that I rattled off, she wanted me to know that there were starker dangers here than air pollution. People didn't leave because it smelled bad. People left because they thought the ring around them could blow up at any time. Some of it already had by the time Rena arrived into the scene. Minnie, an elderly white woman and former resident of Wagner's Point, had a different answer to the question. When I asked her about the local past, she dragged an overstuffed brown suitcase from underneath her bed and pulled out bags of family photos and newspaper pieces. In one, a feature in the paper announced Minnie's wedding to her husband. In another, the handwritten phrase, time bomb waiting to happen, appeared above a list of local factories. How unfortunate, read a book kept in another bag, that this town is today the least attractive. In a fourth, a photo showed a sign at the entrance to Wagner's Point with the graffiti greeting, welcome to hell, question mark, exclamation point, question mark, stuck to a Polaroid of Minnie's son swimming. By the end of the 20th century, the point had become a place of jarring contradictions. Intersections of Carbon Avenue and Sun Street, Quarantine Road and Efficiency Way, junked cars, sunflowers, row homes, and oil tanks marked a part of the city that looked like a terrible accident, the act of an angry god to outsiders like Rena. But insiders saw a death trap that had once felt like a haven. It would take the prospect of grave harm to abandon what had long seemed like safe neighborhoods and it would take a savvy campaign to make that prospect the foundation of their exit strategy. Before that happened, Fairfield and Wagner's Point were tiny bunkers, insulated from the violence many locals said was rampant over there in Baltimore. The point felt apart for many reasons, including a centuries-long effort by state agents to contain environmental risks to this periphery. Now, that effort had led to a level of industrial concentration that posed real harm to residents, but containment was also one of the point's most attractive features. Many told me about the little walls that people built around their lives. Men replaced their work pants every day, women kept their homes immaculate, and area schools remained segregated decades after Brown versus Board, which was not true elsewhere in the city. Even residents of all black Fairfield critical of segregation valued other kinds of insulation. So being neglected meant avoiding more acute forms of state violence. Jenny, an older black woman, said chemicals didn't scare her like police dogs did, and people were close. Downtown, they had crime, one Fairfield woman told me, well, we had community. So if, as Rena put it, houses sat in a big industrial ring, it was also true that many enjoyed elements of their enclosure until they didn't. In the 1980s, locals began to see that certain forms of containment were hypothetical at best, but that they were truly trapped by industry. Now for many on the point, that insight came in fits and starts. Slow forms of toxic trespass, vague illnesses, explosion, fire, catastrophic leak. On one hand, residents were getting sick from local air, thick with carcinogens at levels 30 times higher than the EPA considers safe, precipitating cancer rates among the highest in the nation, which stark as it was, did not have legal teeth. On the other, people were rattled by explosions coming from the region's chemical and petroleum plants, so containment seemed to fail dramatically. And it was in this context that residents began to agitate for relocation. They did so in a very particular way. Rather than decrying the enduring impact of exposure to secure state recognition, residents emphasized their potential demise in the event of a catastrophe. So the events leading up to the buyout hold valuable lessons about how thresholds of acceptability get breached, about the chasm between lay and expert forms of sight, about the fact that disasters make things happen. But what is perhaps most achingly instructive about the buyout concerns why residents' hypothetical deaths came to matter more than their real ones. The buyout turned around a choice to limit charges to the future possible, and you'll see it happened at a time when government and industry had both retreated to the hypothetical, staving off imagined harms while disavowing dangers that were terribly concrete. As a strategy of last resort, residents seized on this concern by adopting a politics of threat, which is incalculable potential Harm. Threat deals in cataclysmic hypotheticals. It does not politicize long-term exposure or systemic poverty. 
Instead, threat management in the post-atom bomb U.S. has been a highly conceptual enterprise in which sensational projections overwhelm the everyday. Threat proceeds as if the most existential obstacles to human life lay then, in the devastating future, and not now, ambient and tedious. Even devastating threats that realize themselves as real explosions on the point seem to matter more as omens of a coming harm than they did as lived experience. Now, there were very good reasons to be concerned with cataclysm in this place. My point is not that this was the wrong political object. In the late Cold War, it was probably the only one that could do what local people needed. Because here, in a place so profoundly shaped by future-oriented governance, hypotheticals had force, and locals knew better than most. They had watched them permeate the political sphere. So what are we to make of their choice to adopt a politics of threat and proceed as if the future mattered most? Did it pander to a violent system? Certainly. There's something deeply compromised about participating in a narrative that contains the local past in bags and stuffs it underneath the bed when you believe that past accounts for present suffering. But residents needed to get out more than they needed an internally consistent politics. And perhaps, like many acts of containment, this move produced a kind of prickly comfort. It kept better times out of the mess. It did not desecrate attachments to this place. In telling the story of the buyout, though, I want to be clear that residents like Minnie and lawyers like Rena did not naively reproduce the conditions of the point's subjection. They recognized the difficulty of politicizing historical exposures in an ambiguously toxic place. I see the choice that followed from this recognition as a studied response of the power of the next disaster to shape life politics during the late Cold War, and maybe still, if we keep that recent cold blast top of mind. Despite knowing that their vulnerability had been produced over years of exposure and neglect, residents took advantage of the state's fixation with the future to get what they needed to escape their neighborhoods. Okay, so it's really hard to appreciate the weight of residents' choice without first addressing how they landed in a place where that choice seemed like the best option. And this was why Minnie responded to my question with her suitcase full of papers. Little clues spilled out of bags and onto the threadbare pages of my notebook while Minnie watched from an armchair in the corner. I remember trying to use the suitcase as a prop, asking questions as I parsed through documents, but it was clear she didn't want to narrate. The whole thing stood in stark contrast with the wry confidence that enabled Rena to compare life on the point with an ill-fated game of Monopoly. The way she put it, residents were thrown into harm's way sometime in the 80s. It was a simpler story than the one that Minnie's suitcase told, which was that people lived on the peninsula before it was industrial and stayed despite the dangers. One thing that became clear as I spread out with Minnie's suitcase was that the very schemes designed to ensure urban, national, and corporate futures had gradually worn away at people's prospects here. It also became clear that residents were invested in this tiny sliver of South Baltimore, even as the place was killing them, because their personal and familial futures had intertwined with corporate ones over generations, tethered first by jobs and then by homes, because those homes were their only assets after work here disappeared. Minnie didn't share her suitcase with me right away. Between 2015 and 2016, we crossed paths each week at Seniors Club, a casual gathering hosted at a recreation center by the Coal Pier. Elders came to settle scores through cutthroat bingo games. I sometimes, or excuse me, Minnie didn't play. She sat along the wall selling sodas for a quarter. I sometimes bought a can to say hello, but Minnie only answered with a nod eyes down, back straight. She was a shy, elegant woman who stood out in an otherwise playful group. She sipped her soda with a straw and ate her sandwich with a fork. Sometimes she'd listen as other seniors reminisced about how nice this place once was, but she rarely did join in. I don't really know anything, she'd say, and then she'd walk away. So I was surprised one afternoon when Minnie tapped me on my shoulder and handed me her husband's <coughs> obituary, tied it with a string. I know it's tacky, but you should know the truth, she declared. Not knowing what to do, I thanked her. The write-up said he died after a years-long battle with cancer. 
It would be another three months before Minnie approached me again and said she wanted me to look at some papers. It turned out the obituary was just the first in a series of exhibits she had set aside two decades back to help secure a buyout for her neighbors. So something that came through very strongly in my time with Minnie and other elders were, was that things were different on the point before. Before life became untenable, before conditions neared catastrophe. Seniors pined for the days they used to hunt and swim off the cove. Minnie arrived during World War II, but she had heard of a time when the coast was lined with dozens of fruit trees. While no one that I met lived when the point was mostly farmland, the inherited impression was that things moved slowly, folks were left to their own devices, and life had not much been disturbed by industrial pursuits. But much of that changed come the 1870s. Seeking to capitalize on the second industrial revolution, a few powerful families incorporated and began selling off land. They advertised the point as the most desirable spot for working men and an ideal site for heavy industry. Print ads boasting that money invested in this land will always be safe, even double itself in very short order, were among the first attempts to link individual financial futures to the promise of impressive corporate growth, and they attracted a diverse array of people. Chief among them were poor immigrant workers from Eastern and Central Europe escaping famine and unrest. Black families also moved to Baltimore from further south as Jim Crow laws grew increasingly repressive. Uh, both groups were drawn to the point's pastoral character, and for those in need of more convincing, one firm offered purchasers free grave sites in what came to be known as Bonus Land Cemetery. So, Mini Suitcase offered insight into a time when this was a peaceful, verdant place, and this was something Rena's perspective made quite difficult to see. It wasn't at all that an angry god had thrown houses into a ring of fire. If anything, that god had permitted volatile developments to encroach upon a calm, bucolic people. But Rena was right that by a certain point, residents here were engulfed. Oil companies were among the largest landholders by the 1910s, leading some to call this area the carbon belt of Baltimore. Chemical and shipbuilding businesses were also growing steadily. And there were signs of trouble in the air. In 1920, one of the region's asphalt tanks caught fire when lightning from a summer storm ignited a pocket of gas beneath its lid. The, riot, uh, the fire raged for 26 hours, leaving the Patapsco River flaming. Before the fire, the point was not a part of Baltimore. It was a rural site beyond its southern border and the reach of its health laws. And what that meant was that things too risky to be sited downtown, like asphalt tanks, were sited here. So here, uh, this is the, the point uh, in red. Here, uh, Baltimore quarantined contagious bodies, including some from here in Philadelphia, that threatened the good health of its working population and built landfills for the city's waste, while locals fueled <coughs> production in a kind of legal no man's land. That production boomed, and by 1918, it had boomed so much that Baltimore decided it was in the city's fiscal interest to absorb the region, right? So wanted to absorb those corporate tax dollars. Propping up a now internal boundary would be zoning, which is a planning tool that promised healthy living via segregation, specifically industry from commerce from residents, though not before the city experimented with racial zoning, as Baltimore-based scholars show. Uh, it's a really fascinating history about which I'm very happy to elaborate, uh, but for now, Coding distinct plots of land for different uses as part of use-based zoning was supposed to shore up public health, stave off accidents, and provide citizens with fresh, clean air to breathe. The city's first comprehensive land use ordinance, passed in 1931, sought to minimize potential future problems by situating danger on the city's margins, and it reserved the point for heavy industry. This was a really important moment for residents, as zoning suffered from a partial vision common among modernist planning schemes. By representing land as absolute space from which all lived complications might be banished, this rubric made the point legible to planners as non-residential, but of course it didn't unpeople the peninsula. Instead, what zoning did was concealed human presence on the point, stipulating that it was not fit for life, and with time that hypothetical would have real consequences for real people. Um, so zoning is something I find really interesting. A lot of people don't. Uh, but it is a, it's a very important part of this peninsula's history. It's one of the deliberate policy choices, right, policy choices, that would eventually make life there so untenable. 
because by disavowing residential life, it intensified the risks of industry. But also, the policy actually deterred city officials from making basic infrastructural improvements to the point, leaving the communities to deteriorate. Known in the early 1900s as a self-sufficient enclave, white ethnic Wagner's Point had no store, no public phone, and no post box by the 1970s. Conditions were rougher still in Fairfield as worker barracks became segregated public housing. As late as 1976, most Fairfield homes lacked sewage lines. One visiting reporter said it felt anachronistic, and another remarked plainly that the city regards Fairfield as industrial, the way that it is zoned, and not residential, the way it humanly happens to be. Now, by many counts, in fact, zoning disallowed life here. And again, this is because planners and officials understand their, their job as to not foster residential life in an industrial zone. Right? Anything that they do to make it easier to live here supposedly puts people in danger. Okay, so even though Fairfield and Wagner's Point had the lowest median incomes in the city, their zoning designation made them ineligible for some war on poverty programs. It prohibited residents from operating a community grocery. The same formal disregard that led the city to insist the point was free of people also meant that regulation there was lax. One oil worker at BP told me harrowing stories about what his bosses did to improve efficiency. Sometimes they'd have us work 40 hours straight and we'd fall asleep at the gauge, tanks would explode. Everyone would run and you could see skin peeling off each other's bodies because the heat was so extreme. So these charges square with others that I've heard and it was not a law emergency. The same year the sky above BP turned red, a railroad car carrying 9,000 gallons of sulfuric acid overturned, forcing residents to evacuate at dawn. Officials blamed it on a soft spot in the road and what this means is that minor oversights, like degraded infrastructure and unpaved streets, were becoming major liabilities. Still, many residents found security in the peninsula's social infrastructure. And that's a term I borrow from residents as well. One Wagner's Point woman put it this way, I know the environment may not be safe, but the community is. People in the tight-knit town looked out for one another. Everyone knew where the old poor and sick resided, and even industry was in the paternalistic habit of paying for holiday gifts and heating bills. I don't see anywhere else in the state of Maryland, the woman said, where people would get the kind of security that they have here. That security took different forms in different neighborhoods. Residents of all black Fairfield built a network of connections that made life possible despite discrimination. Polish families and Wagner's Point took comfort in the private enclave they had fostered over years. Some also found that government neglect had benefits. Again, white children from Wagner's Point rode buses past Fairfield's all-black school for decades after schools downtown were forced to integrate. So being hidden meant freedom from state interference. There were other ways that locals maintained lives marked by containment while toxic matters seep beyond its boundaries. Containment was a practice of endurance, an act of zoning out composed of daily disavowals. Men took their work pants off before they came inside and women slept obsessively. Without the structural safeguards zoning offered other Baltimoreans, locals took it upon themselves to protect their homes from industrial incursions. Some wiped down surfaces to guard against exposures. Others plastic wrapped their things to keep away airborne pollution, even as it slipped inside by other means. Jenny tended to raise garden beds while the whole world changed around her. Many kept the flag up above her front door pressed. Many kept their windows tightly shut. Little comforts, habits, cautions, boundaries. Then in 1984, something blew up at Essex Industrial Chemical. It shook buildings, broke windows, and sent 14 people to the hospital. Neighbors claimed the event put up a mushroom cloud, like the bomb at Hiroshima. And then another spill, same year, released a heady acid cloud. Many remember the cloud as proof of her endangerment. I knew the air was bad, she said, but that was the first time I'd actually seen it. You might recall that Rena was a bit more crass. You can't see toxics, but you can be very agitated about blowing up, she said to me. She wasn't wrong. Compared with earlier events, accidents beginning in the 80s seemed to have an outsized force. They were steeped in the uncertain industrial economy. They were weighted by the insecurities of the environmental era, 
and unlike quotidian experiences of exposure, they were visceral, quick, and clear. Minnie's memory marked a felt distinction that would later be translated into strategy, a recognition that certain forms of harm offered clear proof that life was unsafe here. All right. If popular imaginings of the point at the start of the 20th century were romantic and pastoral, its R near the end was practically apocalyptic. Accidents were getting worse, with more than 50 plants producing high-risk products at unprecedented speed. The end seemed close in other ways as well. Job loss shattered financial futures for the working class, and synthetic chemicals posed threats to reproductive ones. All this in a world historic moment marked by grave disasters. Love Canal, Three Mile Island, Bhopal, Chernobyl shot across their television screens. Folks took bets on how long the communities would last. People joked that the end times were near and told that children sang dark nursery rhymes and some teased that if a single plant were to explode, it would be like boom, 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 the domino effect and the point would get blown off the map of the city. So besides convincing locals that the time had come to fight for relocations, accidents had what some call an enabling power, which is to say that they lent the point a hyper-visibility. All of a sudden, come the late Cold War, the state was prepared to acknowledge that people lived in the shadow of heavy industry. But when residents suddenly appeared to state officials, they appeared within a very narrow frame as the potential victims of a chemical catastrophe while it was true they also suffered cancer rates again among the highest in the nation, the state did not step in to protect health. They vowed to prepare for explosive future threats under the Cold War program of preparedness. And the idea to riff on scholars of this project was to prepare for the worst that was to prevent it, or to enact dystopic futures as a planning strategy. Among other things, this moment saw the development of Baltimore's chemical hazard plan, which is a direct response to the disaster at Bhopal and officials were supposed to test it by staging accidents a couple times a year. Many said that residents, police, firefighters, the hazmat squad, and big shots from downtown were all invited to watch workers on the point play out potential devastations. Just one of many steps that local plants took in the name of managing disasters. And this went some way toward calming anxious people. But hazard planning did so by eclipsing several key elements of their endangerment. For one, Accidents, excuse me, uh, hazard plans located danger squarely in the future, letting the spectacle of prospective accidents drown out the daily violence of living with toxicity. And I want to be very clear that this was more than a perceptual displacement. It also had material effects as resources for hazard planning had to come from somewhere. And some came at the expense of precautionary programs. Programs that if funded and enforced would not only improve local health, but also mitigate against catastrophe. Remember that a dozen little acts had led to residents' engulfment. That poor road and rail car maintenance had spurred the 1979 sulfuric acid spill. That insufficient oversight had fired up the sky above BP. And it wasn't only the case that slow harms could bring about explosive problems. Depending on the chemicals involved, single explosions could have impact bodies over generations. Or consider this. In 1984, a chemical leak from another local plant failed to trigger, trigger an alert system that would alert uh, officials at a nearby bridge. So that cloud pulled a driver's attention from the road, causing an eight-car pileup and 13 injuries. The thing about living in a time bomb is that danger dwells in the beat before the blast. That the quiet and the spectacle are two parts of one machine. Hazard planning missed this defining quality of life on the peninsula, and more because these plans fixated on the hypothetical, they often overlook the place-based details of life on the point, which could have grave consequences in a real emergency. Now, locals knew this, and they often made this point to me through recourse to a public service announcement on how residents were supposed to act in a disaster. Brenda, another lawyer who would later work with Rena on the buyout, laughed as she recounted it. It was so ludicrous, she said to me. The short film opens on a man and woman gardening outside their pristine country home. Suddenly, they hear sirens in the distance. We must shelter in place, the man declares robotically. 
The couple goes inside, climbs the stairs to their room, and retrieves an emergency kit from underneath their bed. They joyfully enclose their home in several dozen pre-cut plastic sheets. Meanwhile, and this is what's really crazy, the scene cuts to the school where masses of children respond to bells with the same efficient, calm comportment. All quiet, quick, and perfectly obedient. But no one on the point had an emergency kit. Even if they did, Brenda doubted folks could tape up all the windows, as most residents were elderly. And in any case, efforts to contain the homes were rather pointless, as the row houses had a common attic crawl space. And what that meant is that if anyone failed to shelter in place, perhaps by not being home, their neighbors would still perish on the scene. So the film was played by knowledge gaps. It proffered a vision of containment so idealized that it had no practical utility. But it did reveal a sphere in which the government was prepared to sustain life in a space it once insisted was unsafe for people. Unfortunately, real accidents were more complex. In 96, a tank blew up at a chemical plant owned by FMC. Employees had been extremely overworked, with many laboring 75-hour weeks with no time off. The explosion that resulted sparked a two-alarm fire and injured six people. But no alarm sounded. That day, uh, I kid you not, plant officials had been away attending an emergency planning meeting with the city. In their absence, according to the hazard plans, tasks necessary for ensuring public safety, alerting residents, controlling access to the site, and more would never happen. Residents demanded officials come to the point to clarify disaster plans, and officials agreed. Two months later, they filled a room, made a brief presentation, and proceeded to show the shelter-in-place PSA on a makeshift screen. So presented in that context, the film radicalized residents. It had alarming implications for those meant to be sheltering in homes separated from explosive plants by just a flimsy chain link fence. Residents pressed on the spot for an evacuation plan before realizing such a plan would be impractical. The point's single access road was often closed in the event of trouble, since responders were supposed to isolate the scene. So what had once seemed to comfort an otherwise chaotic <coughs> home, right, containment, was now a major problem, made worse by the fact that industry and government had produced a scheme so removed from conditions on the ground that we were pretty much left for dead, as one man put it. The consensus among those present was that something major shifted that evening. Now, in previous years, residents eager to escape the point had worked with Brenda and Rena to publicize the health effects of living in a toxic atmosphere. It hadn't worked, but hazard planning failures pointed toward an opening. So rather than staking claims for state recognition on their sick bodies, as has, as folks in this room know well, been the case in context of disaster many times, the call on accounts of Chernobyl and Bhopal. Right? Instead of this, they could assert their vulnerability in the future tense. They would perish in the next emergency. Rena explained, it would have been impossible to prove that locals gradually contracted cancer from one of the region's many plants. But the idea that hazard plants were bad was simpler. You could just look at them and see. So here, as it had with Minnie's exposure to the mushroom cloud, politicizing harm would hinge on visibility. While a core group of residents rallied, lawyers got to work. Soon they issued a report charging seven companies with violating hazard planning policy. Moreover, the report alleged that when companies did submit their plans, officials let them lie in unopened envelopes. When lawyers opened the envelopes, it turned out that companies had tasked the Coast Guard with retrieving residents from this shoreline, likely to be a flame in an emergency. If residents were lucky enough to reach the shore, the Coast Guard might just meet them there, but they were not armed with safety equipment like masks that would protect victims of a chemical release. On top of this, lawyers identified dangerous labor practices and indefensible infrastructural gaps. So for example, some chemical plants had backup generators for their lights, but not to maintain the temperature of volatile chemical tanks should a storm or fire cut off electricity. Both industry and government accused the women of hazmat hysteria, but truly they were scrambling to explain their regulatory lapses. Residents broadcast these failures as accidents waiting to happen, and each one that did happen became further fodder for the argument that the next would be a catastrophe. 
But the complicated truth was that explosions from the region's many plants were more than omens of a coming harm. Each one put off bad airs of its own, slow exposures that provoked slow casualties. Casualties like Minnie's husband, who passed away in 1996 after being struck by four different cancers. One was an oral cancer. Minnie called it a smoker's disease. The doctor wouldn't believe that he'd never smoked a cigarette in his whole life, many were counted, until he found out that the couple lived on the point, where chemical releases were incessant. Then, in February of 98, one of the most vocal local activists, Minnie's friend Jeanette, was diagnosed with terminal cancer. She passed away by April, so two months later. Brenda recalled people thinking, if it can happen to her, it can happen to me. And in fact, Jeanette was only one of three people stricken by cancer that year on her sparsely populated block. Another told his wife to quote, put this in my obituary. I should be the last person to die here. So residents understood. They understood that a focus on preparedness could not capture these losses. And many found this painful. It stung to bracket the deaths of loved ones who dramatized the hypothetical, and for a while the campaign stalled as residents expressed wanting to nail the companies. But officials did not embrace their arguments. Neither did industry executives, who denied any responsibility for, quote, health problems anecdotal evidence suggested were unusually <coughs> severe. As one boss explained to a reporter, I'm aware of any scientific evidence that means we should relocate them, adding that a buyout won't reduce risk only allay fears. It was this very ambiguity that had convinced Rena to pursue an accident-oriented strategy to begin with. It would not be subject to the minutia of formal risk assessment, which companies had become very good at manipulating. The way she put it, focusing on preparedness allowed us to deal in very concrete terms with how there's only one access road, how the last time there was an explosion it caused a nine alarm fire, families got split up, and some people were stuck on the wrong side. So the problems were very explainable. I get it, she continued. People were convinced they were sick because of the plants, and I don't disagree. But the way to go with this was not cancer. There were so few residents you couldn't prove statistical significance. And I felt vindicated when the head of the Chemical Trade Association said, what we need is a health study. She embraced it because she knew you could fiddle around with that kind of thing, change the assumptions and make a big stink. <laughs> well, is it one in a million or one in 50,000? Let's measure all the reported releases. And that path would take forever and get us absolutely nothing. Explosions also clarify the stakes of relocation for residents, right? Living on the point put them directly in harm's way. So locals refocused after Jeanette's death, agreeing to pursue the strategy most likely to get them out. In Rena's words, we picked back up and pushed the accident thing, broadcasting imminent danger. Pushing the accident thing did not take much. Explosions kept on happening. In May of 98, a tank exploded at FMC. There were no sirens, no alerts, and no details shared until the next day. Residents were panicked, but they kept busy documenting this event with the next event in mind, passing evidence that plans had failed to Brenda, Arena and the media. In October, a fireball erupted from Condia Vista Chemical, where equipment was in bad repair. It shattered windows and knocked people off their feet. Some residents, awaiting official notice, pulled out camcorders, remember those, to capture the spectacle. Officials contacted reporters who played harrowing footage on the evening news narrated by locals on live telephone feed. So if the health risks of long-term exposure made for a tenuous case, then botched responses to explosions revealed life on the point to be untenable. They gave lie to the state's protective role, exposing deadly flaws in hazard planning. And crucially, as failures of anticipation, they could be broadcast in terms that limited danger to the possible making the buyout legible as an act of care, rather than an admission of guilt. With time, state agents acquiesced, and local companies were also content to contribute to the fund, so long as they'd be cleared of liability. Liability waivers tinged the victory, but most locals signed the papers. They had medical bills, they were living in poverty, they could not endure decades of costly litigation. Once the papers were signed and residents cleared out, demolition happened quickly. After a years-long struggle capped a century's worth of neglect, the city poured resources into destroying evidence of their inhabitants. It had taken 60-odd years to install sewage pipes in residential Fairfield, but it only took two weeks to raise the several hundred homes in the community. 
Minnie handed me another article, this one about the demolition of the point. It quoted a spokesman for the city announcing officials were, quote, happy the area is clear. We no longer have to be concerned with environmental risk here. On some counts, he was right. Industrial proximity was no longer the city's problem, and everyone could breathe easier knowing no one, no one lived in the shadow of the plants. But his relief also underscored the limits of residents' victory. They won by setting aside a, uh, ambiguous exposures and proceeding as if danger were a threat to be avoided, right, a potential, rather than a condition of life on this peninsula. It was a fiction with a useful clarity. It's true that by displacing issues of contamination from the realm of political debate and forwarding a definition of protection as emergency preparedness, the buyout failed to address problems of protracted harm. In many ways, it released both state and industry from responsibility for a range of problems that were very much ongoing. But it also may have eased residents' own regrets. Imagine having to recast a whole life as a cause of death. And consider honestly sticky questions of culpability. In a rare confession, one woman told a reporter, I feel guilty that I kept my husband here so long. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten cancer. Situating danger in the future may have reassured her too. Little comforts, habits, cautions, boundaries. How are we to square these minor acts of disavowal with disavowal as a corporate tactic? A profitable refusal to connect industrial production with its atmospheric fallout. Are the containments that adhere in many suitcase the same as those emanating from the city? When Minnie put her proof in bags and stuffed it underneath the bed, was she behaving like a docile corporate subject? Did she get to live the big exhale of no longer being concerned by industrial emissions? If these equations are seductive, it's because they're too easy. For one, they too easily forget the power structures that put locals in a bind, all the little ticks before the time bomb reached the point of no return. Land speculation that brought industry and zoning that sanctioned it while disappearing residential life. Land use policy designed to insulate the city's white elite. Poor corporate regulation and inadequate enforcement of those poultry rules that did exist. Degraded infrastructure, labor exploitation, reckless productivity, an economic system that left residents completely dependent on dangerous work, and then when that work left on homes in perilous conditions. A legal system in which the unrelenting haze of harmful air was too dubious to count as evidence of injury. A political and perceptual sphere so resolutely focused on the hypothetical that it did not register the everyday. That worked on future harms by walling off the past. That took up threats and not extended suffering. In the face of all of this, I want to insist on a difference between the disavowals that disallowed life here and those that made it briefly possible. Those countless micro practices entailed in making harm go numb in order to survive. Growing things of beauty in a toxified environment. The way that shifting danger to the future might have kept a widow from unraveling. So yes, residents of the point spoke in terms of threat to secure a buyout. No, they cannot be reduced to pawns in someone else's game. Many was clearly conflicted about bracketing historical exposures and others expressed dismay at disaster narratives inability to capture harms already done. But for all of its faults, threat was an argument that worked. And an argument that worked was needed desperately. The insistence we no longer have to be concerned coming from the halls of power though, this line keeps me up at night for a few reasons. For one, it disavows the fact that every explosion is also an exposure, and that when residents move, they carry years of embodied impacts with them. It betrays a deadly selective attention that continues to this day, manifest in the fact that the city is willing to talk about the next disaster on the heels of the recent coal explosion, but not about residents' exposure to coal dust every day for 140 years. More to the point. This fixation on the boom and not the everyday disasters, this callous disregard for people's lives and deaths, this politics of time, gets us here. By making displacement the solution to environmental problems and settling on a course of action that did nothing to rein in industries embodied or explosive effects, the city all but lived this match. And organizers in South Baltimore are fighting very hard 
to ensure that they don't make the same mistake. Why? Well, as Marx reminds, if history repeats, it will not be tragedy but farce. And if it happens again, I think we call it policy. Thanks. Thank you so much for this amazing talk. I just have a very quick question on the role of the cartoons. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know that cartoonists played a big role in the Cold War in communicating biosafety hazards and, and in this case, disaster management sorts of issues. So I just wonder, are uh, the cartoons here to underscore the spectacular, or is it to underscore the real, in what sense? That's a great way of putting this question. I've gotten this question a few times about these images, so first I'll speak to why I chose them, and maybe that will get me toward an answer to this particular question. You know, I, I fought with myself a lot in making slides for this presentation, because it felt very important to capture the sense of spectacle and the sort of disruptive feeling of it. And I was also very reticent to reproduce images of spectacular suffering, right? For all sorts of good reasons that many, many people have written about very, very compellingly. And so for me, I settled on these cartoons as a way to mark those moments, right? Um, at, at a slight remove from, from lived conditions on the point. I also chose them for reasons that you named, right? Um, to, to sort of pull in the cultural production that was really key both to the way this moment was lived and, and to the reasons that officials, the reasons that officials were, were prepared to apprehend locals as at-risk citizens in a way they had not been prepared to do before. Um, something that I uh, spent time with in the chapter, but not in this talk is is just how closely city officials followed um, like disaster films that were coming out every week in the 1980s and planning their um, you know their public service announcements their um, uh, containment their social containment of disaster around these so uh, those are some of the reasons that I chose the slides what though whether these images capture the real or the unreal. I mean, I think it. Um, I think there's something kind of unreal about experiencing explosions like this at a regular pace when you are also watching them on TV. And one of the reasons, again, that residents were able to articulate themselves as at-risk citizens whose uh, whose deaths rose to the level of a crisis. It, it's not inseparable from the sort of fiction. Uh, fictional stories around spectacular death that were happening at this moment. So, so both is the classic anthro cop out. But maybe that's like why. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kristen, for the talk. I'm, uh, I'm thinking of some neighborhoods in Philadelphia, like the Grace Mary neighborhood next to the fire here. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how the process of dispossession like reaffirms that like profit making. So now that a lot of citizens there have like fought for um, a lot of the issues you've described, the toxicity of explosions, but after they've left, now there's this new process of redevelopment there that's going on, and so I'm wondering like how that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy or that kind of like turn of recodification of land that's happening um, 